Jade Druid. Oh, we're live. And Quest Rogue. <laughs> Warlock, kill me now. All right, guys, welcome back to Star Ladder I Series Season 3. We are here. We will be bringing you Super JJ up against RDU, the Smork Man himself, RDU, with the super aggressive lineup. Up against the lineup from Super JJ that uh, I don't think I've had the pleasure of casting him yet in this event. So I'm not really sure what he's bringing to the table. But uh, I think he's on that Purify Priest hype train that's been uh, kind of going around. A lot of players bringing Purify Priest. What do you think of that deck? So it's interesting because we saw him and Stan Sifka, I think, bring it to the event. They faced off against each other. Clearly, Sifka had the better, you know, the better hand with the Humongous Razor Leaf. But some people are saying that it's effectively just one of the best decks because no one bans it. Mm -hmm. uh, at least very few people do, and so of the decks that remain, it's oftentimes just not countered by anything specific. And uh, it's not so much the best deck across the board, it's just the best deck of what's remaining. And I think that's what makes it so people bring it. Uh, it's kind of a surprise factor. It's not really considered by a lot of people as, you know, kind of the fourth or fifth class you'd bring to an event. But somehow it seems to work for the guys who bring it. It's more of an aggro deck, really. It is kind of an aggro deck, and it, its best matchup in the format is actually against Jade Druid. Which, um, it's because Druid no longer has the ability to answer big minions. They kind of have the tools to do everything else, though. So they really run into trouble against just the ginormous minions that can be made by Divine Spirit. Even if they're not high attack value, just the high health value of the minions allows for so many great value trades. The ability for the Priest to get lots of draw off North Shire Cleric, healing up minions after taking these value trades. And, uh, really punishes Jade Druid. So... It, not having Jade Druid in the lineup for RDU, though, kind of makes it a bit questionable. As we've seen the um, Silence Priests lose a lot to just aggro decks that clear every minion that gets played, that never let the Divine Spirits land, never let the Faceless Shamblers land, and then they kind of just run out of steam with the, Fees, Fees, or the uh, Silence Priests. So I could see it potentially being a weakness in Super JJ's lineup as the aggro decks are not too bad against it. Yeah, and that's really what it comes down to, is that aggro decks can farm that Priest deck. Now, I don't know if Super JJ's made any anti-aggro adaptations to it. Uh, you know, we've seen Wild Power Mancer come in, we've seen the resurgence of Sun Fury Protector in some people's lists. Mm -hmm. The thing that's a bit problematic for, you know, Druid specifically is once that, that board of yours is gone, it's never coming back, and then the Priest just wins the game very often. So, it's a matter of respecting his board and trading away into it as it goes. But it's not going to be a Priest in the first match. It is going to be, on Super JJ's side, a mid-range Paladin up against RDU's Aggro Druid, which... I mean, we've seen that matchup play out um, very, very often in this in this tournament, and this is supposed again to, to favor the the druid player more so with right. hungry crab techs. Yeah, a lot of players in the aggro druid nowadays. It's pretty much core now to run double hungry crab in the aggro druid, and that makes this matchup extremely favored for the aggro druid. It was already quite favored because you oftentimes win the early game. Paladin had kind of weak comeback mechanisms. Now they're running the Wild Pyromancers a lot of the time, so they have better comeback mechanisms. But can you come back really from a hungry crab? Like <laughs> that's <sometimes>. a <laughs> that's a task. Yeah. That's I think no one no one I think has been able to really find a way. I mean that card was kind of a, a meme in the community for so long, right. which makes it so hilarious that it's now core to certain deck lists. You know, everybody laughed at Blood Cell Corsair, said this card's awful, uh, it's a worse ooze, and now suddenly it's just played because patches is a thing, and it happens to hit some of the exceptional Twist Over Champion value turns that the Paladins can get nowadays. So for a like, variety of reasons, the, all these weird cards are coming up, and Hungry Crab is, I think, one of the biggest winners of the expansion as a whole. Yeah, I had to recraft my Hungry Crabs. I had actually... <laughs> no way! <laughs> yeah, I had, I had disenchanted them previously, and uh, I had to recraft them. Are you going with a buff here instead of the Blood Sail Corsair, trying to play around Wild Pyromancer plus Secret doing work on his board, so... Yeah, that's a 4-5 that's a Hungry Crab. That's like Innervate, Chill Wind, Yeti, and kill your opponent's minion. It's just better than Innervate, Chill Wind, Yeti, and it's one card. Oh man, yeah. it's gonna be Ever really tough. Ever had a one minute Black Knight? Yeah, that's. that's Ever disgusting. had a one minute Black Knight? Seems good to me. So Super JJ is really gonna need to hit that equality, almost now. Like he needs it on like the next draw, basically. Otherwise, this board's gonna start getting out of control very quickly, and the the amount of chip damage that RDU is gonna be able to 
put forward is just going to be too much for Super JJ to ever recover from, even if he does manage to get the board clear, because look at that, seven going face through a taunt that turn. Yeah, this looks and like it's over. I really like uh, RDU's respect here for board clears. He's thinking, the only way I lose this with this board is anyway going to be a board clear, so Consecration on its own would set me back a little bit, and I don't want to throw Flame Elemental and Blood Cell Corsair into it. And if he has sure. to play a weapon to kill one of my guys, then, you know, I can just snipe it off with the Blood Sail and bring out patches at the same time. Leaves enough right. mana for Savage Roar to be enabled, so if he draws that as well, it's just going to basically blow out Super JJ. So no matter what, RDU is about... Uh, what 90% in the uh, into into a victory at this stage of the game, but just to edge out the possible losses respecting everything mm -hmm. And so the super JJ is mousing over this wicker flame and the true silver He's deciding between the two advantages of true silver is you get some immediate board clear And you're hoping you could follow that up with more board clear than taunt afterwards the wicker flame is a play that's saying You know what I need to hit this is the quality or I'm going to lose so let's just go for it and uh that's the choices he's got. It's like, is True Silver enough to make me come back in this game, or will I lose regardless, and do I just need to hope for the equality? And he thinks he's got a chance with just the True Silver. And uh, RDU is about to shatter all of Super JJ's dreams and, uh, <laughs> and drop this Blood Sail Corsair, most likely just sealing the game. Yeah, usually that's what's going to end up happening. I guess in a world where JJ picks up... Equality off the draw, he can still stick around. I mean, the game's not completely over. If he gets the equality with the Pyromancer, sets up Noble Sag, that tanks a tiny bit more damage. Then he gets to play Wicker Flame, Burn Bristle, stabilize at the very last second, just needs to get to turn 8 for Rag Light Lord, and then the victory is his, but that's, uh, that's a big ask. Okay, that helps. That a lot. definitely helps. He can shut down most of the board. There's still six, and the hero power threatens to be the seventh point of damage, so he does need to play Consecrate and Noble Sacrifice to stay alive, and he'll be alive at one HP. And then maybe Wicker Flame's able to carry him to enough health where he can land Light Lord, or he picks up the equality to stabilize beyond this. It's We're laughing now, but it's possible. You know, it's one of the rare cases where, you know, the, the game seems to be over, but... There is still a slight comeback chance. So if he RDU plays Wicker runs Flame, no swipes, right? I don't think so. No swipes, right? You'd like to combo this Consecrate with the Wild Pyromancer. So if he plays Wicker Flame, what happens? Is he still alive if he just plays Wicker Flame this turn? He goes up to 11. Mm -hmm. um, guaranteed. So and There's only 8 on board after that. Yeah. You're Nine right. with he, the hero power, I guess. So he could be alive at survive. 2. Right. But he dies to, to mark the Lotus and Roar, right? He dies to any buff card. Any and buff card, yeah. Lugia card. Warrior, any you charge, name right. it. Yeah, yeah. He still dies to any buff card this way, but he has less yeah. potential for a full clear in the following turn. So I'm not sure I like this as much as just dropping the Wicker Flame. And you have the same outs to dying, but this just sets you up in a little bit of a worse position going forward, I'd say. Hmm. Oh, looks like RDU is going to be putting the Fledgling down. It's a card that we haven't seen in every single Druid deck, by the way, right? Like, this card went in and out of a lot of the earlier builds, but I feel like it's starting to solidify its, uh, itself as a... Not mandatory right. presence, but definitely one of the best cards you can innervate out on turn one. The amount of the games you win just from playing this on turn one is, is completely absurd. Well, even just on turn three, it's not bad. Or coining it out on turn two, it has really solid win rates just being played. And yeah. the reason why is because Agra Druid almost always wins the board from the opponent. It is the deck with the most amount of one drops in it. So oftentimes your curve is going to be one drop into one drop buff or one drop into one drop into one drop. And no other deck in the game can really combat that early game curve. So you're going to be ahead on board. They're going to panic, play removal so that you can't land your buffs on the minions you're developing in the early stages, which then paves the way for you just to drop down the flappy pink bird and um, completely destroy them. <laughs> Flappy Pink Bird. Okay. Yeah. That saves you from learning the actual name of the card too, and it's it's like super memorable. It's yeah. a, Flappy it's Pink a Bird. Really good card, and it's a must kill minion in a deck where everything you play in the early stages is basically must kill, because you do not want them developing that board. You do not want them landing the buffs. So even though it's just a three three, it sticks an incredible amount of time just being played on turn three because of how people react to the early stages of your board. I'm not really surprised that we're starting to see it included in the deck uh, as kind of a staple in, in a lot of people's minds. RDU is going to be switching his gears up. Well, switching gears up. Not really. Sticking to aggro, but switching up to the Pirate Warrior. 
Right. So not a pirate heavy hand for the time oh. being. So still a very uh, good hand. Okay. The War X plus the Dread Corsair is an insane discount, as well as just the Captain preserves your minions against pyro quality. Only the Captain will die. The other minions will remain alive at um, you know one health. Yeah, if you have enough pirates. In this case, RDU's God, the War Axe, can play it with the Dread Corsair to establish a pretty strong early board. And then the fact that he's able to transition to the Captain right afterwards to buff the Dread Corsair means that he's going to be in a super good spot. And even the Blood Cell Cultist is showing wow. up. He's got a lot of options here. He's got Coin Captain just to pull out a 2 2 patches to take the immediate value trade so he can strike face with the Worgen. It's the most optimal amount of damage for the turn. He has the War X, which he can just play to try and, you know, get the Dread Corsair out, which protects the 2-1 so he can strike face that way. And uh, sets up for the Cultist for the following turn so he can continue swinging with the War X, maybe. Yeah, so the thing is that there's not really a lot of work that this 1-1's gonna do, so you could just let it be for now. You shouldn't mm -hmm. be getting punished too often. Murlocs are another story, but this little 1-1's not accomplishing all that much. Right. Now what RDU needs to make sure he's aware of is that Super JJ does have these wild pyromancers, so if he wants his board to stick around through the pyro quality, he needs to play captain the following turn rather than cultist. So I believe that's why he held back the weapon swing there, so he could use his weapon swing to react to whatever Super JJ develops, and then not be forced into a situation where he has to play cultist. He saw Super JJ keep two cards off the mulligan, neither of those cards have even been touched yet. So that means they're not one drops, they're not two drops, what are those cards? What would you keep as two cards? And pyro quality has to be jumping to his mind. Yeah, you wouldn't be keeping those Tyrians or the Ragnaros Light Lords in the late game. Uh, if you had some anti-weapon decks, sometimes that's a thing, but not really a lot of room in Paladin decks to make any of that happen. So RDU's got a pretty good idea of what Super JJ probably kept. Yeah, and, and he, he needs to play the captain here, play around this pyro quality. And then if he does that, I, I think he just wins from that position. So this is huge. If he chooses to go with a Cultist instead, then pyro quality clears his entire board. He's on the back foot. He could lose this game. So this is a big decision. And the thing is, it's also one of these cases where you don't lose uh -oh. to anything unless you yeah. play into it, basically. Because it's one of those, like, if you just play the captain, which he didn't, if you just play the captain... He's not thinking you, about it. You're just staying safe from anything negative. I guess he's counting on the captain alone to, to get the job done. Because, I mean, he does have the weapon in hand for four damage. He does have the heroic strike, so he's got 12 already set up. I don't he's think he's gonna have to go through a few things. Yeah, he's just not thinking about this pyro quality interaction, I guess. He doesn't realize that all the minions will live at uh, one health because they get set down to one health and then the captain buffs them up to two health. The wild pyromancer procs, killing the captain that's a 3 1, but the other minions remain alive at one health. So. No but, big deal, uh, picks up a 3 2 option sure. with the Satsu captain. It's one of those cases where. Nothing really uh, too negative happens to him at the end of that sequence. And JJ here on very, very weak minions. They're all stranded. You know, equality already being used for wild power reduces the outs of him finding something he wants. Still has possibibly of a mega sword turn or yeah, some keeper to read more likely than not. But yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, he could have won this more, but he won it <laughs> enough this way. <laughs> That's Hearthstone. All right, sometimes Pirate Warrior just gives you the hand, and uh, RDU definitely had a very, very, very good Pirate Warrior hand this time about. And it's going to go up 2-0 to zero over Super JJ. These anti-aggro techs in the mid-range Paladin, not working out as well as he'd like them to. Pirate Warrior is kind of a special snowflake in that area, though, right? Because they're, the weapons alone and the, the damage from hand is so... such a huge chunk of what they deal to you, starting right. you know, transitioning to the later stages of the game. That unless your anti-aggro techs come in super early, which usually consists of your own murlocs trading into their stuff, um, those anti-aggro techs don't solve yeah. the problem of them tempoing you out. Right. The pyromancer tech isn't really in there for pirate warrior. Sometimes it yeah. helps out, but pirate warrior is the one true burn deck remaining in the game. It's not a like standard zooey board controly deck. It is an actual burn deck. So <laughs> it. it functions much differently than the other aggressive decks in the format currently. And it's really hard to like justify teching against just Pirate Warrior, right? Because when you tech towards, with Wild Pyromancer, you tech against, you know, other Paladins, you tech against Aggro Druid. If you tech with Weapon Removal, you tech against almost exclusively Pirate Warrior. <laughs> it's like the only deck trying to do that. And RDU is going to bring out his 
Agro Murloc Paladin, one of the few players who brought it to the event. Now, against this deck, Pyroway Quality is remarkably effective. If you can just dodge the War Leader that's uh, you know curving out naturally, so if you get to defuse that board, you oftentimes there, you know, that's the matchup in which you stabilize probably one of the one of the most often. And Agro Druid as well, I guess to an extent. But this is where you're happy to see the Cold Light Seer instead of War Leader. Yeah, because it's not shutting down your equality combo. So JJ does have the ability to clear this entire board before Megasaur can come down and then respond the following turn with the True Silver Champion if he wants to. So he's got the curve to be able to shut down the early opening using less cards than his opponent. Pull ahead and card advantage. Just grind him out of the game. Yeah, there's the the temptation of just getting super greedy. The issue is, you know, things can go s very, very bad for you if the Megasaur comes down and gets the right outcome. Yeah. Like, if it's just Divine Shield and you hold on to the coin, you can always go Pyro, you know, uh, Getaway Kodo, whatever, mm -hmm. um, and, and get the job done anyway. But the problem you're running into here is that if it's the Death Rattle with Pliance, then you're giving yourself even more trouble. So, yeah. it's kind of necessary for him to get this done before Megasaur comes out. Yeah, I like doing it now. I think it picks up enough value. Just because he has yep. the true silver to follow up. If he had nothing to follow up, maybe you could try and juice it. But uh, trying to juice this board clear even more than what you got right now seems uh, a little greedy. Oh, wow. Okay. It's interesting. So what he's doing here is he's clearing off some of the power, and then he's hoping RDU trades into the pyro, which or doesn't. Either way works fine for him. And then he can get the equality off the following turn. Yeah, because he's got the pyro master from Makoto, which is the big guy. Right. The big defensive deal. juicing. Yeah. He's been doing that a lot of the time, actually. JJ just usually hydrologists into Getaway Kodo to set up with the Pyro. It's it's one of the quirks of this specific type of list. Mm -hmm. And uh, now the threat is looming over RDU. He's got full knowledge of it. Right. He, he understands that at no point is his board safe barring a War Leader turn or Megasaur with the right death rattle. So everything feels a little bit awkward to RDU at the moment, I imagine. Yeah, you don't want to play Megasword because that plays into your opponent's true silver a little bit. You don't want to extend yeah. both Murlocs under the board because that plays into the AoE. So now you got to ask yourself, uh, what does he have? How do I make a read on this? Is there any way to get some sort of read from the delay that Super JJ had when he was sitting there thinking about the Pyro turn? Oh, man. And now this is JJ's time to shine. He's got himself the true silver champion. He's got a way to mitigate a lot of the damage that's coming in. RDU had the option, of course, to slow down and just play a Stonehill Defender off curve on three. Right. Uh, but that's not what your aggro paladin is demanding of you, unfortunately. Yeah, and so JJ should use the top deck to quality here. And yeah. the reason why you want to use the top deck to quality is because RDU just played into a quality, which means he thinks Super JJ does not have a quality. So, <laughs> the, yeah, see, there's his face. He's like, there's no way he has a quality. I've made the read. I'm the best. So when your opponent makes a read like that, you just kind of try and reinforce it if you can. And JJ reinforces that read. So there's no way RDU is going to think that the second to left card in Super JJ's hand yeah. is a quality. And this is amusing so. because RDU prides himself on just making those reads a lot of the time, right? It's mm -hmm. it's kind of the, the evolution of Hearthstone where a lot of people are trying to read into what people have. And RDU has been doing that for a while now. And... Uh, he was 100% confident JJ would never make such a foolish play <laughs> as to throw out the pyro. Uh, yeah. I'm amused by that. But uh, that value generation from RDU, though, you know, suddenly switching gears to more of a mid range style with the Stonehill Defender into Stonehill Defender to Stonehill Defender. Right. One force all day, air day. Did not find what he wanted based on the face he made here. I'm guessing those are all uh, Gold Shower Footmen and Senjins. Yep, yeah, there we go. Bias. Mm -hmm. Psychotron hits the curve the nicest with the hero power. Not a great card though for pressuring your opponent. Usually you don't put Psychotron in your aggro deck. Um, so what Super JJ wants to be doing is trying to set up for a coin eight drop the best, right? So is there any way to really do that? I mean, develop. you could always just play a Tempo Aldor if you right. like it. It's not a bad play because I mean, I guess Spiker Steed punishes you if that's an RDU's list, which it tends to be. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe just, that's not the best idea, but just reach with silver or something? Yeah, setting a new true silver might be more ideal. He's yeah. at 17 though, so setting a new true silver might just be too slow. I don't know, I feel like it's the best way you stabilize your health total, right? Because you then get healed up a little bit. Because the 3-3s don't trade on the board immediately too well. And if anything, they make RDU's follow-up 
a little bit stronger if he has that steed instead of well what we see in the hand right now which is Psychotron and Drake and everything else right and you do want to get those true silver charges out before Tyrion dies <laughs> yep so it looks like he will indeed opt for that true silver champion and the Psychotron although it's not supposed to line up very well against it since it dies the 1-1 one -one being dealt with here uh, mm -hmm. Really gives RDO hope that the Psychotron sticks around, but unfortunately, that Drake. Yeah. It's gotta be one of the best uh, swing plays against any aggro deck, and this should lock out Super JJ's um, safety behind the 8 health taunt at this point. Yeah, RDO needed to rip Tyrion right there to have really a chance in this game. He's He's got the poison still. That's an sure. out. You can go you Blue Gill Warrior. It out. That's right. Yeah, Blue Gill Warrior. Roll the poison. Kill the 4 8. I think. Any other play this turn, maybe Primordial Drake's fine, but um, other than like those two lines, you're probably going to lose. So at some point, you have to be, realize, hey, I'm so far behind, how do I possibly win? And uh, rolling poison on a charger to kill a 4-8, that's, uh, that's always a way that you can swing the tempo back in your favor, so sometimes you got to take those. Yeah, and RDU here try to set up the Consecration, he's thinking, alright, so the Drake and the weapon trade into my guy, so then I get to Consecrate, extract the most value I'll ever get out of it this game, and then develop my Murlocs onto the board, but there is so much that can go wrong with this. Spikeracy, Dalor Peacekeeper, uh, just another taunt being put in the way to, to stall you, so maybe it was correct to just try to for that Megasaur Hail Mary. Right. Uh, it does look like the Aldor Peacekeeper is going to come out from Super JJ's side to shut down the Consecrate or Primordial Drake number 2 setup from RDU. Force this minion to be awkward and annoying for him to deal with. And this is as awkward and annoying as it's going to get. And now uh, rolling poison isn't even that good because it's only a 4-4. Four -four. So how do we set up a board? Is RDU is most likely not running a quality in uh, this aggressive variant. Kings is Kings is a lot of help actually. Yeah, uh, you just you saw. Get to stick something. Yeah, Aldor was just used, so Kings might be able to be useful. I'm surprised he didn't just Kings on this turn instead of the five four. I think it's maybe the Stonehill Defender bringing out something. Like he knows full well there's another taunt in the way, so he needs to play for board because he can never just ignore what's coming mm -hmm. up. Um, that's another. Another thing he's got to worry about, for an aggro deck, this guy's worrying about a whole lot of stuff. Right. And uh, Super JJ could honestly just equality and clear this whole board. Right? Like, how bad is that? You know your opponent only has two cards in their hand. A lot of the cards in the mid-range Murloc Paladin decks, or the aggressive Murloc Paladin decks, are buff cards. So if you equality here, take the three trades on board, just kind of clean up all of the minions. They can't land any of their buffs. You just continue developing behind that. You know you have the the best gas in the entire, you know, Paladin mirror match with Tyrion to follow this up. I really like that. It's a low value of quality, but... Um, it's it's the best... You're, I mean, it's, I wouldn't say it's the best you can ever get, because you can get super greedy and let them extend on the board, but that's probably the best you're going to get in terms of tempo, because it costs you two mana to get a full board, and then you get to develop on top of it. I'm I'm a huge fan of that line of play. Right. He's just going to drop the Tyrion. I think this is fine, too. Your trades on board are not too bad. You leave up one Murloc this way if you take all of the trades. So, it's not the worst. Maybe he's considering how fast can I end this game. And he's looking right. at Tyrion thinking, yeah, this is probably the optimized way in which I lend a lethal before things go wrong. So I think that's what's in the back of his mind here. But that's going to give the Consecration King's play a lot of value for RDU. It looked a little bit stranded going forward, but finally found a spot for it. Yeah, well, Super JJ is not shy of answers here. Now he can use the equality with the 1-1 just to kill this ginormous Murloc. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what a world we live in. Yeah. Murloc's in the meta. I don't think you want to take six. That seems like just asking for trouble. You do have the, the heal of the Wicker Flame, so maybe it's not too yeah. bad. I, I don't even mind it, to be honest. I think it's perfectly acceptable, but... Sure. Our, JJ just wants to end this game. He's like, you know yeah, what? He's the fast, so <laughs> the aggressive. Faster this is over. I would be more trying playing. to like uh, choke the opponent out for resources. Yeah. But man, he's going guns blazing. He's at eight health right now. True Silver does eight damage. He has the Wicker Flame to stabilize. But if there's any way for RDU to like silence this Wicker Flame or get through it, he's all of a sudden in trouble. Yeah, the Sonsas still have not made their way out of Pirate Warrior and into Paladin though, from what I've seen. So we're still. Right. 
potentially a long ways away, but if RD decided to next level everyone and just went full spellbreaker on us, <laughs> oh, this could be amazing. Another Tyrion's not too bad. Not too bad. <laughs> no, it's definitely not too bad. You're right. It's a fine card. It's all right. Yeah, I put it in acceptable. my deck. It's okay. And before Holy Wrath into Spiker's Steed, just um, jam it to face. Yeah, looks like the stabilization is complete. The Wild Pyromancer plays in the early game are really what allowed Super JJ to win this game. So the tech of the Wild Pyromancer allowed his mid-range Paladin to beat the aggressive variant this time around. But again, I think it's one of those things where in the mid-range Paladin, you're because you have that Wild Pyromancer play, you can you can be more comfortable when starting behind. Mm -hmm. um, the issue is you're really looking to target those board-centric aggro decks. Like, you know, not Pirate Warrior as much. It's a little bit tougher to get the value there, but right. the aggro Druid, when you land that thing on turn four, oftentimes you're able to stabilize afterwards, and then against the aggro Paladin, unless they've get, they're getting the War Leader opener, you've got them you nailed as well. So Yeah. Now we have... The moment of truth. <laughs> the moment and of truth. This is another deck uh, that's a theme in Super JJ's lineup, right? Like, he's got the Miracle Rogue, which has lots of removal to keep board-centric things off the board, backstab, SIs, and whatnot. you got the Priest with the two Wild Pyromancers, and he's got Shadowward Pain, a card you do not normally see in Silence Priest to help keep the opponent off the board. He's really trying to target these board-centric decks with a Wild Pyromancer-themed control decks. <laughs> yeah, and or that's kind of what... Control, uh, you know. Yeah, it's more on the mid rangey side, I guess, because this is no longer just the pure hyper aggro list of Silence Priest, which I can't believe I'm saying those words, but the, um, the way that the, the Silence Priest evolved was interesting, because in the earliest days of the expansion, we ended up with people running Shadowward Pain, Shadowward Death, Wild right. Pyro's Potion of Madness, and then people went all in on the Silence. They said, you know what, I'm just going to play in my own aggro version of this. And so, slowly but surely, we transitioned away from a defensive Silence Priest into a full-on aggressive Silence Priest. Yeah. And now, for the sake of targeting in Conquest, we revert back to the, the defensive ones, which is interesting. Yeah. So it still has a chance against uh, targeting Jade Druid. Like Midrange Murloc Paladin, Silence Priest, Miracle Rogue all target Jade Druid out of the control lineup for Super JJ. So that's one direction he's targeting. But then he's teched them in such a way that they all target the board centric decks of Aggro Druid and uh, Aggro Murloc Paladin as well. So it's a it's pretty cool lineup that kind of hits both sides of the spectrum. He's trying to beat everything, which is hard to do and oftentimes ends up making it so you beat nothing. But <laughs> here we are. <laughs> Sometimes it pays off, and this Sometimes is this, it does, yeah. the, the texture of this hand definitely looks like is the type of texture that Super JJ wanted against that opening from RDU. It's just not going to line up that way. You're not always getting Northshire to counter specifically Grimscale Chum to then follow up with a heal for card draw. So this is one of those rare cases where we see Silence Priest in its in its element, you know, functioning the way that it wants to. Um, Humongous Razor Leaf is a good draw, and you'd be tempted to play it because you can probably Shadow Vision, Purify, or Silence to start trading stuff. Um, right. And the cool thing is that because you have four mana next turn, if you get that silence, you'll have enough mana for Shadowward Pain as well. Oftentimes, that's pretty sweet. Uh, do you worry about Repentance ever? That's another thing to, to keep in mind. Uh, a lot of times, they Repentance your minion, you silence your minion right away, and it's yeah. fine. <laughs> uh, which is always kind of cute, but... Uh, he opts to go with the Shadowward Pain. He really wants to try and save this Northshire Cleric. He feels like he doesn't have enough draw in hand. And he thinks he needs to extend the game a little bit later. So, holds back the Razor Leaf on this turn. And now he's posed with the exact same problem that he had the previous turn, but no Shadowward Pain to respond now. So, I would have liked to see him go with the Razor Leaf last turn. But... Usually, the earlier those guys come out, the better is the gist of Silence Priest. You Because once they're on the board, you can use them as a trading tool. Like They're basically recurrent removal for the entire game, and they only start getting bad against you know the Sunkeeper Tareem in that deck or the Blessing of Kings on the, you know, the minions that have stuck around. So there's a huge incentive to remove the minions on the board as they come out. So I understand why he took that line of play. Yeah. But the fact that RDU had a follow-up makes that line a little bit more... Right. He was really hoping, you know, RDU's follow-up was like Stonehill Defender. Yeah. And then his Cleric would be uncontested. Of the three drops in the, the mid-range Murloc Paladin, the only one that contests Northshire Cleric is the Murloc Warleader. So he took a gamble there and was not rewarded. Now he's taking another gamble, trying to find the Shadowward Pain to try and sure up the protection on the Cleric. 
and um, Fruitless again, just gonna have to settle for the Watcher. Yeah, the cool thing too is that if the War Leader attacks into the Northshire Cleric, there are fringe cases where you're able to potion a Madness something into it. Uh, for instance, if there's only a one Murloc that comes out like Tidecaller, um, if you get to then trade away with the the Isha Watcher, you can then steal a minion and trade it away into something else. Mm -hmm. So, it's, it's kind of... It's kind of difficult for JJ though, if he doesn't get to keep his stuff on the board, because RDU is going to know what's up, and I'll yeah. use buffs to deal with this, frankly. Yeah, I, I'd imagine RDU is thinking about using one of these two kings just to yeah. kill the Ancient Watcher. Uh, even, honestly, Silence is not that bad against you, because Silence is only going to be removing the attack of your minion, and it's going to remain healthy, which is fantastic still. You get a 3-3 a three, three back instead of a 7-3, and your opponent had to expend a card to make that happen. So just keeping JJ off the board, making sure he doesn't have activations for his minions. That's how you beat Silence Priest. You make sure they don't have targets to do their game plan. And the thing that's cool too is JJ now with the second Shadow Visions get kind of a gets a way to bail himself out because he can go for Shadow Visions, pick up a second Silence right that's generated through Shadow Visions, and then sounds off the War Leader, negating Murloc buffs in the process, making sure Potion of Madness is live, and also developing with the five mana total the humongous Razor Leaf. So there's a lot that can go on here for JJ, and that could be the swing turn he's been waiting for. But that Shadow Visions is going to have to deliver. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I imagine that's the play, right? So what is he thinking about then? Is he thinking about maybe not silencing it? Just dropping Acolyte? <laughs> I'm not sure. No, nah, it seems a little bit too, yeah, too risky. You get too little value. Okay, Purify is, you know, it's fine. Because you can silence off your Humongous next turn. And use your one silence to get the War Leader. Makes sense to me. Whoa! Divine Spirit. So he wants the damage. He does not care about using the silence to stop this 7-3 War Leader. But that War Leader is just going to eat up the the 4-8. Right. Isn't he it? could even kings it again if he wanted to. And eat yeah, the yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. He, he also has the ability to just buff it with a War Leader to take the trade there. You definitely kill the 4-8. The question is, what's the best way to do it? That's... It's an ambitious play by Super JJ, that's for sure. I mean, I guess he, maybe he's hoping there's like a coin spiker steed and then he gets to science off two buffs at once. Because at the end of the day, whatever minion gets double Divine Spirited can just win you the game on its own. So that's mm. one of the things to also consider. Right. Oh man, I'm... Ah, let's go. Let's go and see what happens here. You can still get that Acolyte as the target of buffs, right? Yeah, you can definitely play Acolyte and try and buff it. Start beginning your card draw engine. Mm -hmm. He's you can very short on cards, ocean. so... <laughs> he gets a near board clear, though, and the Acolyte can test the War Leader at the end of that sequence, too. Mm -hmm. So... Not the end of the world. Shush! How badly does he want to? I think he pretty badly want to protect this accolade of pain, but zero respect for anything yeah. really. No respect for any card in RDU's deck. <laughs> At well, this point, JJ is kind of just. It is a really low value potion of madness, but uh, the rock pool there ripped for RDU allows him to kill it in just one trade now. <laughs> oh my lord! Do we play Dragonfire Potion? I've seen people run it just as a board clear, but no longer is that what you're trying to target with. That Purify Priest. Mm -hmm. It's been it's played, but... very in the deck. Oh. And he has to use his Silence to activate it immediately, which is expensive because it's probably going to get traded into it regardless if he spent the Silence or not. So now he has to invest to the Silence and, uh... Yeah. Do you Shamble? Or... Because you can wait one extra turn and you'll be very happy about it, I think. You can wait for that Shambler. I don't think you're dead right away. You'll be low. You're... You divine scary. spirit it. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. And then if your opponent chooses to ignore it and go all face, you then get the shambler out that wins you the game. What? And if they try and kill it, if you draw any of your, you know, silence targets, which you're kind of running thin on now, there's only one ancient watcher left, right? <laughs> then yeah. um, you can close out the game. But only well, that having that one ancient watcher. Leaf. That second razor leaf was so clutch. 
Right. Like th this this card right here is the only card I think that JJ got bailed out of the game with. Um, yeah, that was a godsend for sure. I definitely think you divine spirit still. It's really close. I'm pretty sure the fact that you get to heal yourself on top of that is an additional incentive. Because if you're looking to mitigate damage, if he sends 16 damage into this, you're celebrating. Right. Artyu yeah. knows 100% there's a Faceless Shambler. Like, by the delay there and how Super JJ was mousing over the two cards, there's a Faceless Shambler. He doesn't know exactly the best way to deal with this yet, but he knows there's a Shambler. And I think if you just kill the 416, you're good. This is the second Razor Leaf. One of the two Ancient Watchers has been played. That you saw one Divine Spirit, so there's only one Divine Spirit left in the deck. What can the Priest do after this? They're going to be playing four mana 1-1s. One there's also the fact that if you're RDU, you're looking at pushing like 24 damage this turn if you just go all face and then you have Consec left over. And the thing is, killing the Shambler and killing the Razor Leaf, the only difference is one extra minion. The problem is, I don't know if he's able to... to if he can spare that one extra minion. If well, he loses it to the 416. Right. If, the, if you let the 416 live, it kills your active war leader. Yeah. Which and then is you exactly lose all the of your board, and the, you have a 416 taunt looking down. I think you have to kill this 100% of the time. Yeah. I agree. He's going to use the Consec to maximize value with it, and he's going to trade away the Murlocs that are the least valuable and keep himself ahead on board. Only weak, really, to second Shadow Work Pain on the War Leader. Right, that's like the one card you're looking well, to avoid, but you should just be drawing live for the rest of the game compared to your opponent. Right, yeah, Silence Priest is like some of the worst top decks of any deck in the game. If you just <laughs> shut down what their first initial game plan, their whole deck is garbage from there. What so, do you mean garbage? Divine Spirit's amazing on an empty board. Yeah, yeah, definitely amazing. Fantastic card. Well, it looks like uh, JJ is not going to really find a salvage, a way to salvage the game. Again, Dragonfire Potions, possibility. We've seen Lyra in, this, in those lists, so... Okay. You know, if you go Lyra into Potion of Madness, trade her into the 4-4, pick up Shadow or Pain off of Lyra, that's another way to stabilize a little bit longer. He's got to play something or he's dead. So this is the the last stand, as it were. It's sad. Man. Yeah. Fake minions. Sad. Four mana, two, three with taunt. Doesn't death rattle into a 2 2. Just worse than Infested Torn. A card that <laughs> only sees best. competitive play in Nizoth decks. <laughs> Feels awful. Thanks, Shambler. Ouch. Okay. Let's uh, let's make sure we get more stuff on this board. Right. RDU's not slowing down at all. I agree. So, is Lyra, does Lyra ever get you out of this mess? This certainly doesn't. It is, finished. Nope. it is indeed finished, and it is indeed RDU who's gonna win this. Again, with the aggro lineup just tearing apart Super JJ's plan piece by piece. Yeah, Super JJ's lineup goes really broad with what it's trying to do. It goes really broad with its targeting. It has an out against Jade Druid because it has you know, decks that are classically just good against Druid in general. So it's got the Rogue in there that is really good against Druid. It's got the Silence Priest that's an archetype that's very good against Druid. It's got Paladin, which is an archetype that's very good against Druid. Now, RDU does not have the Jade Druid. But what he tried to do with his lineup is he said, I know a lot of people bring Jade Druid. I know a lot of people bring the Aggro lineup. So I'll take archetypes that are good versus the Control and tech them to beat Aggro. And just because they're the archetypes, they'll still do good against Control. And uh, turns out Aggro is a little bit better than that. <laughs> you can't just... Halfway it. You gotta kinda just go full in when you're trying to counter aggro just because the decks are so strong in this current metagame. Yeah, and this is uh, this was kind of a debate that was still happening about two weeks ago. People are saying, is control better? Is aggro better? I think at this point, the clear winner of the metagame, for now, at the very least, definitely is more edging on the aggressive side. So that'll be it for the game. We have two more matches coming up for the day. We've got Shitanodachi versus Zale coming up a little bit later, and RDU versus Zale as well. So Zale is going to be playing two more matches. And uh, talking about aggro...